So welcome to Manchester Festival of Libraries. This is an Inspired by Libraries talk with Guy Garvey, hosted by Cheatham's Library. Um, I'm Hannah Barker from Cheatham's Library. I'm not really in Cheatham's Library today. I'm just pretending. But this is the beautiful Cheatham's Library, um, which people can visit at any time. I'm really excited to welcome Guy today. He's the, the lead singer and lyricist of Elbow for over 25 years. Sorry if that makes you feel, yes. <laughs> he hosts a weekly show for Six Music and he's also a solo artist. Alongside his best mates, Elbow Guy is the co-recipient of a Brit Award, Mercury Music Prize and three Ivor Novello Awards. The most recent for Magnificent, she says, from their UK number one album, Little Fictions. The release of Elbow's eighth studio album in 2019, Giants of All Sizes, became the band's third consecutive UK number one album. Guy's also been awarded an honorary degree from Manchester Metropolitan University for his work in the arts and was recently made a visiting professor there also. In addition, Guy has collaborated with, amongst others, Massive Attack and Craig Armstrong and co-written and performed numerous soundtracks for TV and film. So, Guy, welcome to the Libraries Festival. Well, I sound great, don't I? You sound fantastic. <laughs> well Thank you very much. That's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> That's what happens if a historian's asked to give an introduction. <laughs> we, like, we like to do our research, you see. Now, we know you're busy in this studio with Elbow at the moment, but you were really keen, so thank you, to be involved in the festival. Absolutely my pleasure. It's our pleasure too. I wonder if you, we could start off by you telling me why libraries are so special for you. I like anything, uh, I like anything by people for people. You walk into uh, uh, any institution which is, is there because it's there for the common good. Uh, and, and libraries are the absolute, you know, they're the original, aren't they? I guess alongside hospitals and schools. It's um, th just the idea that somebody had an idea uh, to make things available for others, to share the world's knowledge. You know, uh, I, I, think, I just think they're those remarkable institutions, those beautiful old ideas. They're the very best human beings can be in those places. So, uh, and the fact that there's, there's never, you know, there's never usually thousands and thousands of people in a library. There's a handful of people use it at a time. Uh, and the beautiful library that you've got as a backdrop and the other ones in Manchester that I love so much. Uh, uh, it's the ennobling of the common man that happens when you walk in between the pillars of Central Library or up the stairs at the library you've got there at Chetham's. Or, you know, it's, it's the fact that John Ryland's had electric light before anybody else did and it's made out like a church. It's like, I love libraries because they're one of... Uh, a handful of examples worldwide of the very best that human beings can be. And, and libraries like, like Cheatham's and like the Rylands and, and the Central Library are all public libraries. Yeah, exactly. That's the key they're, thing. Yeah, they're there for everyone. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that Cheatham's is the oldest public library in Britain, actually. I did know that. I did know that. Yeah. I've trotted that out here and there. <laughs> Usually in London pubs. <laughs> yes, and, and, and Rylands was a gift to the people of Manchester by Enriqueta Rylands. So these are all libraries for the people. Absolutely. It really, really should be named after her, shouldn't it? Yeah. So, Guy, what's your first memories of using a library? Uh, Sunnybank Library, which is now Sunnybank, I think, I don't think it's called Sunnybank. I think it might now be called Unsworth Community Centre or something like that. It's still there and it's still for people. Um, but it was a library when I was a kid. Um, where I grew up in Hollins in Bury, we'd walk across the golf course at the top of the housing estate where I lived um, into Sunnybank and it, it kind of popped up right behind the library and my mum, uh, my mum gave me my appreciation of most things, uh, including the library system uh, and I remember the kind of I, it was, I, I remember the heat and I remember the dust and the smell of the books. I remember like heart beating that there might be an Asterix book that I hadn't uh, seen on the shelf, you know, that I might be able to get hold of a Rupert the Bear annual that I hadn't seen before. 
Um, and it was just a lovely thing. It was one of those things that uh, my mum, my brother and I shared, you know, we'd all get a book each on a Saturday. Uh, and so, yeah, that was my first experience. And what was it that you think drew you to Asterix? Um, well, first of all, it was cartoons. Um, it was the fact that the language in it, there was quite a few um, Latin and Roman jokes in there that, that really would only appeal to people who had any knowledge of what you know the translations were. Um, and as kids do with things they love, uh, cartoons, books, TV programmes, you'd quote them, you'd, you'd quote Asterix books and, um, uh, and adults would laugh out loud and then I'd ask them why and I'd find out there was another layer to it. And, and also the drawings were just brilliant. I can remember the style of the, of the, of the drawings so beautifully and it was a weird history lesson. I, I enjoyed, uh, my mum told me I was really clever uh, from, from day one. Um, she also told me I was a really good painter and drawer um, and she still insists I am. I'm not, but uh, it took me to go to uh, to study art at Sixth Form College and be told by my teacher just how bad I was. Uh, my mum told me I was pretty much good at everything, but I, I enjoyed the sort of, I loved it for what it was, for like a bang crash wallop kids cartoon, but I also loved there was an extra meaning to it and it caused me to ask questions about the Roman occupation of, of Gaul and of Europe, you know. Oh, well, anything that gets you into history, of course, I approve of. Yeah, of course, yeah. But, but, but I was just thinking about, about books and literature and, and, and songwriting. They're quite closely intertwined, aren't they? And I wonder whether you think your, your reading from your childhood and as an adult has helped you become a better songwriter? Uh, definitely. Uh, into, or, uh, you know, whether it's improved my skills, I don't know. But certainly my enthusiasm for wanting those skills... Uh, I had and probably still have somewhere um, a very 80s um, ledger, like um, funky stationery. I think it had a girl in sunglasses and maybe a sports car on the front of it um, and kind of sort of weird pop art dot thing. And it was graph paper inside. Um, and I remember after reading The Demon Headmaster when I was 12. Yes. Yeah, I stayed up to read it. It was an under the covers with the torch job. Um, and I remember then wanting to write a book and I started writing a, a story. I, I decided that this funky book was going to be my first novel. Um, and, I, and I started writing this story about robots taking over the primary school I attended. Um, and I remember realizing that a whole book was way too much work for me. <laughs> At that age, I knew that it wasn't going to be books. Uh, and I started writing bits of poetry. And the first poetry I wrote were limericks about my classmates. Uh, and they were, first of all, funny, insulting ones. But then somewhere in there, I started writing flattering ones about Julie Foster. You know? and, and it's About Julie Foster? What was what? Tell me about Julie Foster. Uh, Julie Foster. an object of admiration. She was, secretly so. And um, my, my, one of my older sisters dated a big brother, John Foster. Big Catholic <laughs> families in Whitefield. I, I remember the first time, Julie is a jewel wrapped in a chain. What's going on there? <laughs> I don't remember the rest of it. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, something about it. And then there was dra drama... Uh, and music sort of hand in hand. I didn't study music, but I, I really loved drama. Uh, and then somewhere in the middle of all that performance. Uh, and then, yeah, my first band when I was 14. The synoptic reverb, we were called. Fantastic. Yeah, it means nothing. Yeah, but uh, we never did a gig. We used to get together in uh, Our Lady of Grace Scout Hut in Presswich. Uh, and talk about being a band and smoke loads of cigs. But uh, yeah, so being in a band was was partly a gang thing, but woven into that was this idea that I liked the idea of being the guy with the journal that sat and wrote his thoughts down. And I still am. So the importance of language and the importance of writing and the importance of reading, therefore, 
that all comes from libraries, do you think, or a lot of it? A lot of it. And, and it's also that, you know, I mean, you don't acknowledge these things for a long time sometimes, but there's a, I, I'm somebody who needs a lot of company or no company. Uh, and, and the writing process gives you exactly that, if, as particularly if you're in a band, you know, it's like uh, the collaborative nature of being in Elbow all these years. Uh, I realise I'm a collaborator, and when the music's concerned, I need that, actually. Um, I can write it on my own, but I don't enjoy it half as much. The word side of things is this really lovely, comforting, lone pursuit. Um, and then to put it to this music that the, that the lads and I put together, and for them to trust me with that part of what we do, uh, is, is like, it's well, it's given me my whole life. It's given me everything I've got, including my wife, you know, it was my... <laughs> I, unbelievably, it wasn't my dance moves or my snaky hips. I do find that hard to believe. Yeah, well, exactly. But uh, but no, it was the words that she was interested in first off. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it really is. And I still love doing it. This room is where I geek out on words. Yeah. Have you ever written a song in a library? Many, yeah. In fact, I've I've done far more writing. If I, I very rarely go to a library to read, or to or to study, if if ever, in fact, you know, I, I've gone to libraries because if you're writing, particularly if you're writing to music, you can't do it in a coffee shop. It's, there's normally music on, particularly nowadays. Um, the uh, Britain's Protection uh, doesn't have a jukebox, so that that was always all right for sitting down and writing, but. No, libraries are great places, and also for, for people watching. And also, that thing I was talking about earlier, um, this ennobling thing when you walk in, you know, and my granddad, and I've said this many times, but um, but it's a good one, so I'll tell you it again. Uh, my granddad used to walk, um, not just me, but all of his grandkids. He'd walk us past the library, the central library, and he'd say, you see that there, that's yours and you own every book in it. Never let them take it off you. He'd say that, you know, uh, and, and it's kind of like that knowledge made me want to go through the doors. And if, you, if, you, if you're being creative, if you try to write things, and, and um, you know, and I hate to say it, but particularly in the north of England, if you've decided to be a writer or an artist of any kind, that, that you've got a great big tar pit to wade through of, of perceived disapproval. You know, it turns out there are loads of people willing you on. It's just, I don't know, something to do with the flip side of unionism is there's an awful lot of don't you dare break ranks. You know, we're in this together. So first, you know, so you walk into a building that actually says, come here, all this is yours. You know, please come and create, please come and study, be the person, you know, you want to be. When I, when I first of all talked to the students, I mean, because of COVID, since I was given that very flattering appointment of visiting professor, I've only actually managed to do one lecture. Um, but the first thing I said to them was the fact that you're here, you've got into debt and you've come to the city and arranged your living, living circumstances so you can come and study to write means you are already the person you want to be, you know, and, and that that's what a library makes you feel. It's sort of it. It's a place to lift people up and say, Here's the world's knowledge at your fingertips, or as much of it as we can fit in this room. You know, come come and be who you want to be in here. It's that idea, isn't it, that's behind the design of of, of um, places like the Central Library. This idea of the dome that surrounds all the knowledge in the world. Yeah. I mean, obviously it doesn't, but there is a sense that everything's there, isn't there? Yeah, and and you feel you feel the hand of your forefathers, and you feel the, you know, the the, the thrill of the. I mean, I, I love I love that the the sort of aspect of, shush, don't touch, has 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 changed mm. a good bit in libraries, and um, that the redesign of the central library and putting laptop ports in and stuff, I think it's absolutely brilliant, you know, and to make them a little more vibrant and not not just hushed reverence, you know. Um, I think is is amazing, but you do, yeah. Underneath the dome, absolutely, you f you feel the dome of of, uh, of of human knowledge. And, and I, lo I, lo I, lo I love the fact that yeah. they didn't know that it was opaque. Uh, they didn't know it was glass. 
Yes, until yeah. the refurb. Yeah. Until the refurb, they did, and it was so dirty that everybody had forgotten that the middle of the dome was glass. I mean, that's great. That's a really central piece of knowledge that was buried in soot. Yeah. And then, yeah, what was he, what was he called? The head librarian that oversaw the refurb? Neil McInnes. Neil McInnes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then for him to decide that it'd be a great idea to share that daylight with the room below by putting glass behind the old reading desk. I mean, so generous to, to people, you know. That he was the right man to carry the torch, I believe. Well, he still he still is. He's still there. Oh, good. Please yeah. give him. <laughs> please give him my regards. <laughs> I will. Will you give them to him yourself now? Yeah. <laughs> are, are, is there any of your of your reading or any um, any books that that has ever directly inspired your your songwriting? Do you think? Yeah. Or, sure. or is, it, is it more complex than that? No, no, I've, I've directly lifted things from Salinger. That happens quite a lot because uh, particularly his short story writing, mm. it lends itself to lyricism because um, they have kind of an, an emotional punchline in short stories. You know, he, he kind of brings you in under false pretenses, gives you information you don't know is central to this huge emotional impact that's going to happen at the end, usually in the very last line of his short stories. And it knocks you out in the way that a well-placed word or lyric or, you know, line of poetry can knock you out, you know, in its generosity or its insight. So, yeah, uh, I have to be careful because I have got an example of something I'm writing at the moment that directly cribs a bit of Salinger. Uh, but if I start trying to tell you about it, I'll cry. <laughs> so I'm glad to leave off that. One one thing we ask we, we ask you to do today is um is is to choose a piece of poetry for us because I know I know Simon Armitage is often on your program. Yeah, uh, always he, these days. He, always, you can't get rid of him. Yeah, no, I get rid. <laughs> You ask him to pick a song each week, and we wondered if we could do the reverse, and and if you could pick a poem for us and read it to us. Well, I think um, uh, we were just talking about. I went to see Simon and his band uh, play at the Jazz Cafe last week. Um, terrifying when your friend tries something new, you know. Um, and spoken word over music, I've seen it not work a hell of a lot more than I've seen it work but it was electrifying, it was such a good gig. Um, and I think really Simon's delivery and also his style of poetry uh, and also what he chooses to write about, um, it does lend itself to music. And I know music's been a huge influence on his writing and on his poetry. It lends itself, uh, it lends itself to being performed in that way. And I knew I loved Yeats. I was introduced to Yeats by, um, an ex um, and loved him ever since. And, but that I didn't know the song of Wandering Angus until I heard it made into song um, by um, one of my favorite songwriters is uh, a, a writer called Jolie Holland. Mm -hmm. And she's from the South in America. And it, she's, she's got a beautiful Southern drawl and she's very, very much I wouldn't even say alt country. She's she's country. Mm -hmm. She has a beautiful sort of bluesy country a, a element to her. And um, <clears throat> she did an album called Catalpa, which is a real bedroom album. I, I urge it. I know people recommend things to people all the time, but the album Catalpa by Jolie Holland is direct from the heart onto the tape machine into your ears. Uh, there's one song where she even drops a massive cough in the middle of. The <laughs> Gordon. Um, and when you listen to it a few times and you think, why didn't she just play the song again? Was she in a hurry? And then you realize that just before the cough happens, the frog in her throat gives her this beautiful, fluttering little fluty moment in her voice. And you realize that she decided to keep the cough on account of the lovely thing that happened before it, which couldn't have happened without it. Uh, and in that way, it's something unrepeatably human. Anyway, she covers covers she puts a, a William Butler Yeats poem called the song of wandering Angus which is quite famous 
Mm -hmm. she, she puts it she puts it to uh, music with a southern drawl and it's spellbinding um so i urge you to listen to that but here we go <clears throat> the song of wandering angus i went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread and when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Beautiful. Thank you for that. He's a clever lad. And do you know what? When you hear him reading his own poetry as well, I was I was stunned. He's incredibly austere. He sounds like a right wag, doesn't he? But that's, that's just the way people used to speak, I think. I mean, they used to present, certainly if they knew they were being recorded. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Dylan Thomas I, sounds like that too, an incredibly posh and non-Welsh. Sorry, who does as well? Dylan Thomas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we know he was... Naught but a tear away, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, Butler Yates, though. I mean, I, mean, I imagine him prancing among hills and hiding his face in crowds of stars. And no, he's like, st st I like what he said about uh, meter as well. People are asking if they what should people stray from the meter, and he's like, he basically said, No, it took me ages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with him. <laughs> There's a sense, though, when those people were in the past of being recorded, a sense of how you were supposed to read poetry to the public and how you were supposed to behave, that, that people like Simon Armitage are, are changing. And it, yeah. it made me think about what you were saying about how people behave in, in libraries. And, and it's great that you've always felt welcome in libraries. But what would you say to any people listening to this and perhaps younger people or or anybody who thinks libraries aren't actually places for them? I, I, you, you can only become familiar with a place by going a couple of times, you know? I, and I think I remember as a young man, sort of right up until my uh, 22, 23, when I went into the Met Bar in Bury, which is a cafe bar, the door was a bit too well lit. So I'd come in through a side entrance, you know, and, and you do feel strange. You do feel anxious about going into any public space when you're young. And what I would say is get over it. Look at the sides of these places and all the work that's gone into putting them there for you, you know, go often enough for you to bed in and feel that it's yours uh, because it's just so rewarding. And also how many great love stories begin in libraries. There's, there's loads. You know, you know what kind of person you're after. They're probably in the library. <laughs> I've always suspected that when Neil put those red booths in, in the central library, yeah. he was trying to encourage snogging. Yeah, can, can I just say that I cannot condone any overt sexual behaviour in the library. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep calm. <laughs> <laughs> Be comfortable, but not too comfortable, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> or you might get in trouble. <laughs> I've, 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 I've never frotted in a library. I, I promise you, no. Frotted. <laughs> yeah, there's been none. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you, or pretending to speak to you from Cheatham's Library today, which is a library that's that's right next door to a music school, and and I suppose. Whenever I come to Cheatham's, it reminds me of, of the creativity of Manchester, the, the literature and the music. And, and I wondered whether you had some thoughts about what makes Manchester, or perhaps Greater Manchester, I should say, um, 
such a city of literature and culture and music and creativity because you talked about the North sometimes, I don't know, the Northern voice sometimes being silenced, but actually in music, I think perhaps that's not the case. What, what is it about Manchester and, and the, the towns around it that makes it so creative? I think it's a, it's a place of firsts and always has been. I think it's large enough to realize your dreams globally or small enough to feel part, a really important part of a community. I think uh, London swallows your whole. You know, you can feel part of boroughs of London, but Man Manchester gets behind its successes, you know. It's really, really hard. I'd say it was harder to get people to come and see us in Manchester City Centre, to, first of all, to allow a venue to put us on, and then to get people to come and see us at a venue uh, that was more difficult than getting a record deal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because you're doing what? What? Band? It was that initially. Uh, but then, of course, it, as soon as the dial moves a little bit, as soon as one publication takes you seriously, this is what we found, then suddenly the support of the whole community is behind you. Uh, and, and not just other musicians. I mean, we did. We saw the Stone Roses on the stairs of a rehearsal complex. I think it was the one at Sankey's Soap. Mm -hmm. And they nodded to us and it was a respectful eye, lads, you know? Uh, and it was like, oh my God, that made it achievable. You know, in the same way as the char the charlatans were like that with us, you know, they're just, they, you, can clock a, 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 you can clock a band member in Manchester, can't you? There's a bit of a uniform, or there certainly was then. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps a bit more difficult now because, thank God, there's women involved now. There never used to be, or very few, you know. Um, but, like, uh, yes, so a nod. I remember um, being in the Night and Day Cafe, being in the Roadhouse, these places. You'd see your heroes and they'd, you know, they'd give you a nod, they'd give you encouragement. And at the same time as that... Um, you've got all that vibrancy surrounding Cheatham's library and, you know, and the Royal Northern further up as well, you know, all the young musicians that, that are in town uh, and the swirling, vibrant nightlife. Uh, and also that thing that you've got these noble old institutions cheek by jowl with people trying new things and not having it that it can't happen in the city. You know, and, and, and we absolutely benefited massively from that. Uh, I mean, Cheesham's itself is like a little, um, an enclave, isn't it? it? It's like a real, they're beautiful old buildings right at the heart of the city. And you're sort of greeted by them a little bit. Uh, and yeah, just seeing those really pasty young people that, that haven't had a meal in, in, in years. <laughs> And you think, I bet you're really good at the piano. <laughs> In fact, I remember one guy, and I won't tell you his name, but there was one guy studying piano at Cheatham's, and he found Matt and Fred's jazz club on Oldham Street, and he found it around the same time as I found Chet Baker and strayed into jazz for the first time because Chet Baker was uh, an icon I could sort of connect with. Yeah. Uh, and through him, I, I mean, I love jazz now, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of jazz, but he was my first. So suddenly the whole kind of uh, the beatnik side of all that kind of thing appealed to me. And I found myself in Matt and Fred's on a regular basis and getting to know the guys that ran it pretty well. And then this really handsome pianist uh, who was Scandinavian, I can't remember exactly where he was from, just dropped off the Cheatham's radar and became the absolute draw at Matt and Fred's and all kinds of beautiful people turning up suddenly to watch this guy play. And he was getting drunk and beating up his piano very theatrically every night. And the guys that owned the place just fixed it and invited him along the next night because people were piling in to see him. Uh, and then eventually there was an intervention from one of his tutors <laughs> and he was dragged back to Cheatham's. Um, but that, that's I know exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's like, and they're not exclusive, you know. I'm not involved with the school, but I would just like to say on behalf of the school that, that children are fed. 
<laughs> and are allowed outside, whatever you may think. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> Can we bring you back to libraries? Yes. And I wondered if you had a favourite library in Manchester. No pressure. <laughs> I love them all. Um, we had a, we had a photo shoot with the amazing Paul Husband, who's just he's the best photographer working. He's incredible, um, and I insisted it was in Cheatham's because I love it so much. And he did this really great biblical thing, where we look like something's going on. Uh, it looks like Pete Turner and I from the band are requesting something of the Potter brothers of Mark and Craig, and they're really not sure if they're having it. And that is so true to life, even though it was a post shot. It's one of my favourite photographs, and it was taken in that beautiful place. It's just, I mean, in terms of... I was in Manchester the other day for the first time in a long time, for obvious reasons. I hadn't seen the Pankhurst statue. Uh, I was just thrilled with that at last. Um, and wandering around, I went and checked on... Sappho at the art gallery. I've been in love with her since I was 13. Um, uh, all the usual things that I do, and one of them is wandering into the libraries. I do it with all of them. So they all have very specific feelings and memories for me. I've been going into Manchester Town Centre and wandering between the places you can get in for free <laughs> since I was 13. And, uh, and Cheatham's is one of them. It's just so beautiful. We are so blessed with libraries in Manchester. I mean, Cheatham's, but I also work, as you know, at, at the John Rylands, but also yeah. the Central Library and the Portico Library, and they're all just a few footsteps oh, away from each other. Yeah, I'm a member of the Portico. I did, I've did. i done quite a lot of work in there. Uh, and also, yeah, Mrs. Rylands Library, I was in there. In fact, Pete, Pete Jobson and I would always, uh, I mean, Pete and I enjoy a pint most of the time. Um, I'm pretty sure Pete was with me when I ran into you in the Eagle that time. Yes, I, I, that must have been somebody else. I'm always in the library. <laughs> All right, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, and we'd, we'd say, walk the earth. And, and what we'd do is we'd just wander around town talking. Yeah. Uh, it was a way of delaying the pub for an hour or two. But we'd always, we'd always end up in Mrs. Ryland's library, always. And it's, uh, yeah, you're right. We, we have an embarrassment of riches on the library front, haven't we? Yeah, and, and pubs. That's fine, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was lying when I said I didn't meet you that time. <laughs> just, just in case my boss is watching, yeah. I think you're a dad now. Yeah. Are you planning to impart the same love of libraries? Yeah, of course. And, yeah, he's just moved, you know, tentatively from picture books to us reading him Roald Dahl at the moment. Oh, brilliant. Which, you know, as a parent a very protective parent. Roald Dahl's, it's like, every now and again, you're like, well, what? You know, it's like, there's one, Tim was looking out the window and he heard a voice in his ear. It was the devil. I'm thinking like, he's four. Um, but, but yeah, so we're reading those. Um, and yeah, we kind of go back to, to and from the sort of picture books at the moment with him, because he is, he's just four, but his reading's coming on great. Um, and he's guessing at words that he sees on the screen and things like that. So, yeah, of course. I think um, it's amazing when you become a parent yourself and you start reading children's books, how transgressive a lot of the books that people read in the 60s, 70s, 80s were. And massively. I, I kind of missed it as a child. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And it's kind of like, you, you wonder, like, where's my barometer? You know, <laughs> I, when do I say this? Is, when is this suitable? Do you know what? I was concentrating so much on the BFG's voice um, that I kind of, I, yeah, and also, you know, with my wife being an actor, uh, I, I'm in real competition with her over the voices in, in, in Jack's reading. I was concentrating so much on the West Country snozcumber thing that it escaped my notice. I was reading really graphic accounts of how these giants were eating children. Um, and then eventually he put his hand on the page and I went, Oh my God, is this a bit too scary? And he went, yes. <laughs> oh God, I've traumatised him, competing with my missus. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think you will. And um, <laughs> to, to, uh, uh, as a parent of older children, reading to your children is just a gift. Oh, parents yeah. make time for it. 
oh no it's just perfect and and it's the most wonderful intimate thing you know and it's like and i'm i'm totally aware that how long am i going to be able to keep hold of him listening to his little end of day sighs you know with him in my arms it's it's like soon he's going to be like go off you know although actually he'll be more like get off <laughs> We, we have the opposite situation. I have, I'm from London and have kids with Northern accents. And, yeah. And you're the other way around then. Totally. It doesn't matter how, how, how you do that one. I'm going to feel like a traitor to region and class, aren't I? Yeah. And, yeah. and wait till he starts mocking you on your accent. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait, actually. <laughs> I get that all the time. I'm going to have a bath, Mum. Oh, no. Now you see, at the, mo at, the, at the moment, he's still bath. Yeah. Yeah. Although he says water. Oh, blessed him. But I quite like water in the southern accent. It's better than water. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you're leaning into it. And and it's apart from children's uh, children's writers, who are your favourite authors now? At the moment. Oh my. What goodness. are you reading? Um, I've been reading a spy a spy novel at the minute. Um, Eric um, Ambler is he called? Yeah, the 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 mask of Demetrios. Um, I fancied something really. How can I put this? Uh, the word I was going to say was etched. So I, I um, like um, the way the characters in that kind of novel. I mean, uh, I love a spy novel. I, I love intrigue, um, and. There's some, yeah, there's something about that kind of writing, which is really, you can't go too far into a character because that's, you know, that's flying in the face of any intrigue. You, you kind of got to make a handful of observations and move on. And also when I'm reading, when I'm reading a book, I'm, I am, I've got one eye on the style. I'm, I'm very rarely reading purely for the story. In fact, never, if I'm, if I'm completely honest, I can't help reread stuff and wonder where it's going and it's actually it's the same with movies I'm, I'm rarely sort of pulled into the plot i'm always wondering how it's made um if it does surprise me if if, if something grabs me emotionally uh, in a clever way i wasn't expecting so i just finished watching the mayor of east uh, mayor of east town yes <laughs> I, I said the mayor of east town because yep. i can call it the mayor of eastbourne but <laughs> <laughs> but the last episode of that was so incredible and complex and brilliant and, and going back over it for days, certain elements of it were badge and gun, you know, you've seen it a million times, but then so much of it was, was from a woman's perspective, a completely different thing. Um, and as a study of industrial America as well, uh, amazing and, and sort of, you don't often see, unless it's, when, when you see dramatization of uh, poor America, mm. it's usually dirt poor. Mm. Uh, where, whereas that is, is, it's a lot more real, that, that very specific, every, everyone's getting by, uh, but actually spiritually, it's pretty deprived, you know? And, and, and like, yeah, I found it very real on account of that. And and, um, and actually, it's the first time I've really enjoyed Kate Winslet. But oh, but yeah, if I'm honest, you know, I'm not like I've I've just never really. She's never really. Uh, anyway, I thought it was brilliant. So yeah, Eric Ambler, I'm finding it was recommended to me by the guy that works in the bookshop at Euston Station. I always buy books when I'm to or fro Manchester, yeah. uh, and. He, he, and, he, and he's like, what have you enjoyed recently? And what did I tell him? Oh, I just read some Graham Green. Yes. Um, and he waved Eric Campbell at me and I've really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Well, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The Mask of Demetrios. It's full of like ancient clunky stereotypes, but it's a good romp. Yeah. A good. I, I, think, uh, I think probably reading that kind of stuff and crime novels of... A lot of people have turned to that in the pandemic, I think. It's yeah, just... a little bit lighter. Yeah, yeah, mm. I think so. Although why crime fiction is considered lighter, I don't know if you think about the subject matter, but but it is somehow. Um, 
I mentioned that you're in the studio with Elbow at the moment. And before you go, I wondered if you could just tell us when we might expect some new music or a tour. Um, well, hopefully September we're touring. It's been postponed three times already. Um, so fingers crossed, everybody. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of counting on that. Uh, and then there'll be some new music. Uh, I can't give too much away. But we're, we're working on something a bit special and I've been for the last however long it's been, 18 months of lockdown. We were promoting a new record uh, when when it all stopped, Giants of All Sizes. Um, and we're most of the way through making another record that's very, very different from that, which is kind of, as you can imagine, it's been made apart from one another. Um, and at the same time as that, we're getting together to finish it. Uh, somewhere very special yeah so um, I can't give away any more than that because my manager will yeah crucify me but, but thank you that's really exciting and something for fans to look out for oh, and I yeah. will see you next time you're in Manchester in the library absolutely I'll or in the Eagle be. yes <laughs> <laughs> which has just had a refurb and he's beautiful by the way oh yeah. Well, it was beautiful before, wasn't it? Well, I like Central Library. They've kept everything that was wonderful about it and, and improved on it a good bit. Yeah. it's a oh, Brilliant. Well, I look forward to that too. And it just remains for me to thank you so much for coming to the Manchester Festival of Libraries and talking to us today. My very great pleasure. Thanks for involving me. Very pride-making. Oh, thank you. Well, we're very proud of you. So thank oh, you very much, Guy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>